Welcoming back to the program, Matt Duss. He's now visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, former uh, senior policy advisor, uh, foreign policy advisor uh, to Bernie Sanders. Um, uh, welcome back, Matt. Thanks, Sam. Great to be here. Hi, Emma. Hey, Matt. So, all right, Matt, um, you and Stephen Wertheim uh, over at uh, the um, uh, Quincy Institute um, have uh, written a piece in the New Republic, A Better Biden Doctrine. It is basically a look at an assessment of what uh, Biden's been doing in terms of his foreign policy set against some of the um, uh, pledges he made as a candidate, uh, particularly uh, in the, um, the, the general election. And uh, made a little bit of an assessment. I'm I'm gonna hold off on trying to give you make you give him a grade. Uh, <laughs> no, that's like, <laughs> um, let's go through the things that you perceive uh, are are positives in the in the sort of the positive column, and then we'll get into the things where uh, the Biden doctrine could get better. Sure. Yeah. Well, as you said, I mean, we're not Stephen and I. You know, didn't like the goal here wasn't to kind of say, here's our ideal foreign policy and here's what Biden's doing and here's how he's falling short. We're trying to, to kind of look at the commitments that candidate Biden made and the Biden team made on the campaign campaign trail, particularly in the, in the, in the party platform in 2020 um, and see how, you know, the last few years have stacked up compared to those commitments and those goals that they themselves laid out. Uh, so we, I, and, and just, and before you get into that, I said, will you just assess relative to what, um, from your perspective, might be a a good foreign policy. Like, where was where was the Biden sort of, I guess, um, aspirational doctrine? Mm -hmm. Let's call it that yeah, for a moment. Sure. Um, where was that relative to where we have been in the preceding, you know, uh, uh, Democratic administrations and and, and uh, you know, uh, right. maybe uh, Republican ones. Sure. No, I think, you know, even though Biden himself, as everyone knows, is, is a longtime, um, you know, member of Congress, member of the Senate, kind of a creature of the establishment in a lot of ways. Um, I think the platform and, you know, the way that Biden and his team ended up talking about foreign policy was, you know, a considerable improvement. Um, I would say even from the Obama administration, um, not just, you know, with things like ending the forever wars, which, again, is something that Senator Sanders and others like Senator Warren um, in, in the 2020 primary we're talking about. Um, also, I, as we note in the piece, like, you know, the, Biden's speech, for example, that he gave, the first big speech he gave to Congress um, in April 2021, I think, where he had the first, um, sorry, um, where he like essentially announced, <laughs> where he essentially announced the, uh, the end of the neoliberal era. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge step forward. Uh, for the president of the United States to basically come before Congress and say, listen, the economic model that we've been using um, for the past decades has not delivered the American people. The American government is now going to be spending money and investing in American communities now in a big way. And I think that's important. And that obviously has global implications because the kind of global, you know, the neoliberal model of globalization, as we've seen, has contributed to enormous uh, inequality, both here in the United States and around the world. It has contributed to the rise of authoritarianism. Um, we can talk more about that. And, and this, you know, the kind of democracy versus authoritarianism framing has its real issues uh, and concerns. But I do think as a general understanding of, you know, what, what should America be trying to do in the world and how should we be trying to do it and what tools should we be using? I think you saw you know, a lot more creative thinking and frankly, a lot more openness um, to voices from the left on the, in, you know, in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and beyond, at least in the fashioning of, of, of the platform. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. just one more thing. You, you, you cited uh, Jake Sullivan saying that domestic uh, foreign policy is domestic policy and domestic policy is foreign policy. What are the implications of that statement? Because it, it, it does feel like in the past there has been a specific um, attempt to delineate those two things so that the implications of foreign policy and the motivations behind our foreign mm. policy yeah. are obscured on a, 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 within the context of domestic politics. Right. I mean, I think what that shows, I mean, this is one of those things that people in Washington would say all the time, you know, including, I think, you know, John Kerry, when he ran for president, we need to be strong at home to be strong abroad. You know, it's one of those kind of talking points that you hear. But I think you see a real attempt um, 
to actually think through what does that mean? Um, you know, why do we need to, you know, why, why it's, it's a way of thinking about foreign policy that says every decision we make, every policy we undertake around the world, there needs to be some way to justify this um, to the American people to say, this is how this makes your life better. This is how this benefits your community. This is how promotes this promotes our security and prosperity. Because I think, you know, what we saw, I mean, 2016 was a wake up call um, for a lot of people um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, Donald Trump's victory, but not just Trump's victory, but I also think the the kind of the, the phenomenon of, of, you know, Bernie Sanders critique of the establishment resonating so widely um, I think, you know, for those who were willing to listen, and I do think there are people on Biden's team who were listening, and that includes Jake Sullivan, um, the lesson, you know, who, of course, was a close advisor to Hillary Clinton. Um, the lesson was the way we talk about policy in Washington, particularly foreign policy, is completely detached from the lives and realities of so many Americans. And they are deeply skeptical that people in Washington um, care at all. Um, and that's one of the things that contributed to the kind of populist upsurge for good and ill. I, obviously, as someone who's close to Bernie Sanders, I think there are huge positives um, to, to progressive populism. I have, have obviously very real concerns with right wing authoritarian populism. I would make that distinction. But at the basic point here is that there needed to be a serious rethink about how we talk about and implement um, foreign policy. And we have to be very, very mindful of how we justify this uh, to the American people. Yeah, I think that more holistic view of foreign policy is reflected in this kind of like underreported positive from the Biden administration of how drastically they've reduced drone warfare uh, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Like, I mean, that was a hallmark of Obama's foreign policy. Uh, and then Trump increased them as well. And Biden has drawn them back uh, quietly. And it's that that's something I wish got more attention because I yeah. think that is that fits nicely into your your commentary about about the way they they view uh, foreign policy. Right. No, I think that's that's a great point. And we you know, we, we we note this in the article. That is a positive. I think, you know, the broader ending the forever wars framework, that is that is a kind of item that that is included in the platform that Biden talked about. Um, that's how he justified, you know, one of the ways in which he justified the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is wrenching as it was, I think was the right decision. Um, um, very, you know, even more so um, over a year later, um, you know, but at the same time, one of the concerns we raise in the piece is that even though I think Biden is moving in the right direction with regard to drone wars, um, you know, they've made, they've, ma they've determined, I think, with some good reason that you know, if we don't make a big deal about these things, I mean, you say it deserves more attention. I think it does deserve more attention. Um, but that's kind of the, the the problem here is that their, their their approach seems to be if we don't give like right wing demagogues a target to shoot at, um, if we do these things quietly and improve policy so that we're killing fewer people with flying robots, but we don't see it all over the New York Times, then we won't have to spend a lot of time responding to, you know, Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson and whomever. Um, but the downside of that is, you know, you're leaving those tools in place for a future administration. Um, and you're also not by not engaging in a very public and energetic debate around what the right policy should be. You're kind of leaving you're you're leaving a consensus in place. Um, and I think, you know, the bottom line, in my view, is if you want to change and, and, and create a better consensus around these tools and policies, you need to get into public debates and win them. I thought that was a fascinating uh, point you made in, in your piece, and I hadn't really contemplated that. Uh, I mean, it, it, the analogy I see is I remember uh, in 2010 when the Obama administration on the domestic front was like, we, c we don't want to expend any political capital explaining <laughs> why, uh, you know, government uh, tightening its belt is not the same as like, you know, the, t the belt tightening for, you know, uh, around the kitchen table. And, and unfortunately, they not only want to expend the capital to engage in that fight, they capitulated in that fight. Mm. In this instance, the Biden administration does not want to engage in that fight, but yeah. they are they're they're they are they're winning that fight. But it is a pyrrhic victory if the American public is not made to understand why the use of drones is problematic, broadly speaking. Right. And that's and that's the point you're making. And I thought that was was fascinating. Let's move on to some of the other areas where uh, the Biden administration is not uh, 
meeting their own standards that they set. One of them, they've cut back on the uh, dramatically on the drone war. They said they were going to shift their position in terms of support uh, for the Saudis relative to Yemen, but that really hasn't been the case. Well, I think they have, you know, significantly diminished support. Um, you know, they came out early on um, and announced that they would be ending, you know, quote, offensive support for the Saudi war in Yemen, but they would continue defensive support, um, you know, for Saudis defending its own territory. And again, you know, having, you know, being on the Hill at the, at the time, you know, I and other colleagues and, and other offices made you know, efforts for months to get them to try and kind of, you know, actually explain what this distinction meant. And hmm. it was very difficult. And they, they, you know, my point being like, if the president and his team are saying, are making this distinction publicly, they should be able to explain what it means publicly. Um, and we never were, never got an explanation that was really satisfying. But, you know, the basic point is, yes, they, they significantly diminished um, the amount of support they were giving to the Saudis. Um, did they fully end support? Um, you know, do they continue to um, supply and repair and, 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 and contribute to the upkeep of, of Saudi planes that, that do these bombings? Even those, bo those bombings have significantly diminished. Yes, they do. Um, and they've also invested, and I think this deserves good credit, and we, we give it to them in the piece, you know, by creating a special envoy, uh, Tim Lenderking, with, whose job was to try and find a diplomatic resolution to this devastating war. I mean, they really sort of, you know, they put their policy, you know, money where their mouth was, so to speak. Um, they really invested policy energy uh, in that effort. They achieved a ceasefire and then an extension of the ceasefire. Um, so is the crisis ongoing? It still is. Is the war ongoing? It is. Um, the situation has improved somewhat. Um, you know, there are talks that Lender King has been engaged with among the sides. He's been coordinating very closely with the UN. That's all positive. Um, but still, the broader issue of the U.S.-Saudi relationship, um, without question, I think, has been a disappointment. You know, Biden said, I want to make him a pariah in reference to Mohammed bin Salman. Um, you know, they did this thing where they released the kind of intelligence report around the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. But since then, it's been a slow but steady kind of revert to the norm, which is mm. a very close relationship with the United States and Saudi Arabia. That was uh, in large, it seemed to me, in large part, a function of them fighting the uh, inflation narrative and and a combination of of the the inflation we saw in the context of of oil prices, which mm. was, I mean, to a large extent about refining capacity, at least uh, right. it, it seems to me that had been drawn down during covid. And yep. then there was a refusal to ramp it back up because why do you ramp these things back up uh, when, you know, maybe down the road you're going to be having a diminished um, uh, need for. Uh, fossil fuel refining capacity because that's the way the world is going. So let's and and the uh, the for the past year the war the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Yeah. Let's talk about that yeah. and your perspective on on the Biden administration's approach to that, and then we'll get to uh, China, which I think is right. um, far more problematic in many respects. Yeah, I mean, I think that the segue makes sense, right? Because even, I mean, the justification justification you'll hear from a lot of the folks in the administration is like, well, Ukraine changed everything. Um, you know, we we you know we can't be fighting with the Saudis at the same time we're trying to help the Ukrainians uh, fight the Russians. But the fact is, I mean, they this this you know this um, kind of rapprochement between the U.S. and Mohammed bin Salman was well underway. Uh, before, um, you know, the Ukraine war happened. I mean, it's just, it provides, I think, I don't totally discount it. I think it is true. It has made things much more complicated. Um, but I, I think it, it also, in some ways, provided a very convenient excuse to do and accelerate what they were going to do. Uh, anyway, because, you know, it's not just oil. This is a very, this is a deeply rooted relationship uh, for good or ill, I would say mostly ill. Um, not just on the issue of energy, but on you know intelligence, on defense. Obviously, Saudi Arabia spends a lot of money on American weapons and put lots put lots of money in the bank accounts of defense contractors, and they would like very much for that money to continue to go to their bank accounts. Um, so you know, shifting this relationship um, is is an enormous challenge in the in the best case scenario, um, which we are not in right now because, as you said, Ukraine. Um, so yeah, I think we in general. You know, I think all things considered, Biden has handled uh, Ukraine fairly well. Um, 
you know, I think their goal, they've articulated like three main goals here. One is not to be drawn into a war with Russia, the United States or NATO. It's to help Ukraine defend its own, its territorial integrity and to produce a strategic defeat um, for Russia. Now, I think the, you know, all of those things, I think thus far um, are, are they're succeeding at. Um, you know, I think in my view, it's interesting, you know, a lot of my, my colleagues and, and friends at what might be called the restraint camp, um, including you mentioned uh, Quincy Institute, um, you know, folks who, who, who I know and have worked with for, for a long time. You know, I think some of these folks on both the left and right um, have been a bit more critical of Biden on Ukraine, raising some questions, which I think are legitimate questions of what are our interests in Ukraine. But my own view is, you know, Biden is practicing restraint in Ukraine. Um, he's being very cautious not to be drawn in, not to allow the U.S. to be drawn in, certainly with U.S. troops, which he took off the table very early on. Um, but at the same time, he does recognize, I think rightly, that there is a pretty foundational um, international norm at stake here with regard to, you know, states should not, you know, be allowed to invade and steal large chunks of land from their smaller, weaker neighbors. I don't want to make it seem like I read every quote that you have in every piece, Matt, <laughs> but I know uh, just a couple of days ago, um, you had said something to the effect of like, you know, there it, it is important to make sure that um, we are, we, that, that this, our uh, helping with the protection of Ukrainian sovereignty, I'm paraphrasing you now, yeah. um, needs, you know, we need to be careful that it doesn't slide too much into the protection of those bank accounts. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, how, A, how do we do that? Like, where is the line? I mean, this has been my uh, perspective uh, from the beginning is like, you know, where is, what's the end game here? And how do we know when we've achieved it? And how do we, how do we, um, you know, in the same, I would use the same analogy in terms of like, we're not, the, the, the administration has decided not to invest in uh, its political cash in the, um, in the, the fight about why drone wars are bad. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, the, the analogy here, like how do we not increase the role of militarization if we're fighting? I mean, it is like largely, like you say, we have a strategic, uh, yeah. there's a strategic benefit for us to, to have uh, Russia's uh, capacity to wage an invasion like this diminished significantly. Um, you know, some people might refer to that as a proxy war. I mean, arguably it is. Um, and, um, and, but how do we, how do we, like, what's the limiting principle here? Yeah. No, I think the limiting principle is, you know, you, you know, a sovereign state, Democratic or not, I mean, this is why I, I, you know, even though I think it is good to support democracies and and not not support autocracies, I think, um, you know, I think the issue here is, you know, Ukraine's sovereign territory has been invaded, um, and Ukraine has a right to defend it. Um, now, that's certainly something the United States has, has violated in the past. It's something we we we've supported our partners and client states in violating in the past, and. I think that's a fair that's a very fair point to raise and we we should we should discuss it when appropriate but that I think my my approach here would be say well let's let's do better ourselves let's we do have an interest and again as a progressive I think uh, I, I think we do have an interest in you know supporting and, and 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 forging a set of norms and strengthening those norms and pushing others to follow those norms and rules um so that might does not simply make right um but I think the question of where does this end, where is this going, that's a powerful one. I think the approach right now has been to continue to support Ukraine. Um, you know, and I think we'd be, we were in a very different situation, say, in the early summer when things seemed to be stalemated. We saw a, a, a very effective kind of um, series of campaigns um, by the Ukrainian military in late summer and the fall to take back large swaths of territory. I think the approach right now is to continue to support that and put the Ukrainians in the best possible position for negotiation when the, those negotiations uh, become right, become possible. And I, and I would note here that, you know, it is Vladimir Putin who himself who has not really shown any interest in those negotiations. I mean, I would very much agree with those uh, who say that the administration should be maintaining contact and, and, and trying to reach out uh, to the Russians at all levels. And I think they are doing that. I mean, we saw a, a kind of a, a flurry of stories in, in the fall 
um, around, you know, you know, national security advisor Sul Jake Sullivan's contact with with people who are very very close to Putin. We see the the ongoing, you know, so-called red phone between Secretary of Defense Austin and and Russian Defense Minister Shoigu. Um, we've seen, you know, meetings at various levels in in, in various places all along. I think th this is the way that you kind of continue to put feelers out to identify possible paths to eventual negotiations. Um, I do think there's a sense out there. Um, I think it's all, you know, often offered in good faith, sometimes not. But the idea that we should just be doing more diplomacy if we just press the diplomacy button harder, then we could we could end this war sooner. And I and I sympathize with that. But but I do think from what I've seen and read, um, you know, the administration is is doing the work to try to identify a, a credible path to a negotiated end. Uh, let's let's turn to China where. Um it feels like we've headed in the wrong direction. Um, yeah. and, 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 and there's, there's some tension here. I mean, aside from the fact that like as early as, um, gosh, in 2012, I can't remember what ship I was on. I was stuck in long beach overnight. Cause I, uh, they gave me a voucher. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I took a later flight from LA, that's the truth. And, uh, uh I wanted that cash. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was on like, I, I know it was like a warship in, uh, on long beach. Maybe it was an aircraft yeah. carrier. And I went into this like room and there's a guy there and there's a whole map of the U S uh, fleet. And this is like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And he, they had just like moved everything over to the, uh, to the Pacific mm -hmm. for the Asian pivot. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, you know, the TPP, uh, that Obama was pushing was all uh, part of this Asian pivot. And, um, we see this increasing sort of like uh, I'm quite convinced that Iraq, frankly, was about China as well. Uh, I've told mm. the story many times about uh, Gary Hart's uh, 21st century um, uh, threat to U.S. Um, uh, uh, security held and uh, that wrapped up, uh, you know, and, and told the uh, Bush administration that it was non-state uh uh terrorist that they should work a uh, watch out for and uh, there was one mm. person on this uh committee who every time they met kept bringing up china when they finally uh, laughed her out of the room uh she never came back but that was um uh liz cheney uh mm. or lynn cheney i should say lynn cheney. and and um and so uh but well, if you remember, I mean, not to just stay in this room, I mean, China was the new hotness, right, before 9-11. I mean, folks remember this. Remember the Hainan Island um, incident very early in the Bush administration? Um, you know, you had a, a, an American plane that was essentially forced down by yeah. Chinese letters. Um, you know, through the 90s, I mean, China was going to be the new big enemy. I mean, this city was getting ready for that. And all of a sudden, you know, it turns out, no, actually, we're going to slot in terrorism for the Soviets instead of slotting in China. Uh, but now we've kind of return, returned to, to plan A. And, and, and you know, there's some, like, you know, the COVID showed the need to sort of, like, make our supply lines a little bit more, a, a little mm -hmm. bit closer and a little bit more durable. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a way of doing that where we do not decouple yeah. ourselves from China. Because having that reliance on China also yeah. inhibits the potential for some type of conflict because we're in the same boat uh, you know yeah. they need us we need them the way that we 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 make our supply lines more robust right. is as important as making them more robust no that's absolutely right and this gets to the broader issue here it's like you know we need to diversify and create redundancy and resiliency in supply mm -hmm. lines because that is good <laughs> for our country that's going to protect us from a whole range of potential crises. You know, we need to invest in American industry and, you know, in American communities um, because that's what the American government should do for American communities. We don't need to justify all this or, or we shouldn't need to justify all this on the basis of this is how we fight China. And yet, unfortunately, um, this tends to be, you know, a way of pressing the easy button in politics is to justify, to justify it all in terms of this is how we defeat the big new enemy. Um, and I understand that impulse, but I think, you know, and as Stephen and as I write in the piece, yes, there are certainly very legitimate challenges and concerns with the Chinese government and their and their policies and their vision for China's role, you know, versus the United States in the world. Um, we should be clear-eyed about that. But the administration does seem to be moving in a direction of, 
you know, basic of, you know, any, any economic success, or I'll put it this way, that crushing China economically and suppressing China's economic growth is part of how we win. Um, and here, this is an area where I think President Biden's rhetoric and his policy are Terry telling two different stories, as we put it in the piece. I mean, President Biden, and we appreciate this, you know, whenever he speaks with President Xi or, you know, he speaks about U.S.-China policy, it's, oh, it's, we don't seek a Cold War, we're not seeking conflict, we need to identify areas of cooperation. And that is good because that is all absolutely true. Uh, but when you see things like a few months ago, the announcement of restrictions on, on semiconductors, mm. um, these are very severe uh, measures. Um, you know, because ultimately, as I said, we're going to be clear eyed about, you know, China's policies and its goals and, you know, compete with them uh, where, where we can and must. But ultimately, we need to find some way of coexisting. Um, and I think that the policy is sort of locking us into a, a very, a very competition, if not conflict frame here. Let me let me ask you just one uh, more question about a region that you didn't really uh, address in, and in, in this is, I guess, more a, a sort of a broader one. Uh, when uh, you know, we just watched what what, what took place in in Brazil, yeah. and um, uh, where like where are we in terms of this hemisphere and yeah. and and our per our uh, disposition towards you know left of center um uh governments in this hemisphere because you know yeah. traditionally we haven't had a great record with that <laughs> that I, is I, true you may be aware of that <laughs> i am somewhat aware i have heard tell of such things um no i think listen the 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 quick recognition of lula's victory by the white house followed within 24 hours by a phone call between president biden and lula is enormously positive and it's a very positive change from the Obama administration, who kept Lula at arm's length. Um, so, I mean, this is an area where I think there has been really positive change. And part of it is that, you know, this is Biden responding to a different political environment. And I'll just give credit here to, to Senator Sanders, uh, who has been, you know, very vocal about this, particularly, you know, about uh, Brazil's elections, um, because Bolsonaro very clearly modeled himself on Trump and was very clearly teeing up a stop the steal movement uh, for the election. Senator Sanders, along with Senator Kane, offered a resolution out of the Senate, making clear that the that the U.S.-Brazil relationship would suffer, including the military relationship would suffer in the if there were any shenanigans. Uh, that 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 resolution passed by unanimous consent, but that kind of you know, affirmed and was meant to underline and reinforce, I think, some of the messages that the administration was already sending, including by dispatching CIA Chief Bill Burns, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin, and Jake Sullivan himself down at various times for consultations and with their counterparts in Brazil to send that message that we want a free and fair election. Um, and I think that was very well done. So that that's an area, and you're right, we didn't mention it, but that's something I think they do deserve credit for. Um, their posture toward Lula, but also towards some of these other more left populist governments we've seen, like Petro, like um, like Boric, and others in the region, is very, very different from what we've seen from past democratic administrations. At the same time, they're hosting democracy summits and saying that Guaido is the legitimate leader, right? So you, the, the, I mean, the, that yeah. those are improvements. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I just think you know, back to your critique that was mm -hmm. you know more big picture about their inability to sell some of this stuff to the American mm -hmm. people. Yeah, it seems like um, outside of a few key areas, yeah. they're they're they are in a defensive posture, mm -hmm. and I don't mean that uh, in, in terms of you know military operations abroad, yeah. but you know, I hear your recommendations. There's a lot of action words like they should be proactive on this yeah. or they should be forging this. Yeah. And for for most of the, the through line that I see is that when Democrats come in, sometimes there's restoration, there's uh, an effort of stabilization because Trump wrecks so many things, but less of an active push towards restoration. And mm -hmm. then things continue to devolve. Like right. what what we're seeing with our relationship with Iran is that yeah. that that's the that that peace deal is shattered. Yeah. It's it seems to be uh, the case. So, um, I, I, do you agree with that general critique? I would agree, and I think you know the one. I think the one overall. <laughs> approach this administration takes to foreign policy in general is we want to spend as little time as as necessary fighting about foreign policy. 
you know, and I get, you know, and in very practical terms, I guess that makes sense. They, they want to be talking about things that the administration is doing and delivering for the American people that are much more tangible in a way that kind of a lot of these sort of high flown foreign policy debates uh, aren't or, or, or they feel they aren't. Um, but, but the problem is, as I said, with regard to drone strikes and the war on terror is the downside is that you are not, you know, forging a new and durable consensus about America's role in the world. And, you know, I would go even farther, you know, it's not even a restoration on a lot of these things from, you know, Obama to Obama. It is an affirmation of Trump's approach on some mm. of these things, What, like Iran, essentially, yeah. you know, that we say straightforwardly, Biden broke his promise to quickly rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement. They drag their feet. They try to keep pressure on in the hopes that they could potentially maybe get a longer and stronger deal. And what is the result? We may never get that deal back. Um, we've just continued with all the sanctions that Trump put on, um, and we're now in a situation where we're, we're you know, very much in, the, in, 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 in a worse position on Iran's nuclear program than we were, you know, even under Trump. And again, with you know, with China, it's a very similar thing. Uh, the president's rhetoric is better. But if you look at the actual policy and, and, and the approach they are taking on the path that's putting us on, it, it is very similar to Trump. And I should correct myself, because while I was out, I guess there was the official change on Guaido. Um, uh, but mm. but, you know, I was I was harkening back to a little bit earlier. But uh, no, just note that. And um, we should say that official change came in large part because his his tenure is acting president. I love just the idea of acting president. Um, <laughs> You're uh, acting president. I, I, yeah, I, I've been I've been acting. president. You've been president the acting quite, uh, quite U.S. Well. I'm the acting host of the show. <laughs> um, uh, I love the idea that that uh, that one can be acting president and that that term i guess his uh, term came to an end but uh matt i had a lot more questions we're gonna have to have you back because we didn't even touch on uh africa but i think uh, in a large spot yeah. uh, uh the perspective it's it's sort of a it seems a rather ad hoc uh when it comes to a large uh, swath of that uh, continent but we we will talk more about that next time we have you matt Duss, a visiting scholar at the carnegie endowment for international peace we'll put a link uh to your piece that you wrote with stephen wertheim uh in the new republic uh and uh talk to you again soon thanks for your time all right thanks a lot thank you